Today we're talking Guard, and specifically some of the scariest units in 9th edition that the Astra Militarum can bring to bear. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focus 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. As we know, 9th edition has changed the way that quite a lot of armies will want to play 40k, and the forces of the Imperial Guard are no exception to that whatsoever. Whether you're playing with them or against them, I thought it might be helpful to just run down some of the units that I think are strongest in the Guard army at the moment, and are most likely to make appearances in droves in more competitive lists. These aren't in any particular order, but I'll just run through each of the units, why I think that they're strong, and ways that I'd be tempted to field them myself. So first up we have the standard powerhouse that is the Lehman Rust Demolisher Tank Commander. They have taken a slight relative points hike in 9th edition, but this doesn't stop them from being pretty much the most cost-effective anti-tank firepower in the entire Guard Codex. I would consider the default option just literally a bare-bones tank commander with a demolisher cannon and a heavy bolter or last cannon now, which will set you back just around about 190 points. If you can get a shot off with a demolisher cannon on an enemy toughness 7 or toughness 8 vehicle, then you have a very good chance of one-shotting it if you're using the tank order to reroll ones to hit. You'll be averaging 10 or 11 wounds with that grinding advance double shoot bonus, which means that you have a very high chance just to blow the thing straight off the table in one go. With the blast special rules, they're also non-trivial against infantry as well. If you do happen to be fighting units that are 11 or more in size, you're going to be flattening a fair number of them by having a flat 12-shot demolisher cannon. There aren't all that many targets that will happily be hit by this thing. In general, I'd be most tempted to field it with one of the regiment that gets it plus 6-inch range. You can get that either from the Rostroyans or by making a custom regiment where you can have plus 6 inch range and also re-roll the number of shots or automatic repairs each turn. Despite this awesome damage output, in terms of durability it is fairly expensive for a toughness 8 vehicle, so despite the imposing stat line it is a little bit of a glass hammer I would say. I quite like the option of using the tank ace traits to increase its survivability, particularly going for the minus 1 damage one which can really help fox a lot of damage to or more weapons. If you want to make it even more damaging and even more of a glass hammer, you could think about taking some sponsor and weapons for it, and they're looking like they're going to be getting a lot more tasty with these new updates that Games Workshop are rolling out. Damaged two heavy bolters, two shot multi melters, or 12 inch heavy flamers are all looking nice. In particular, two shot multi melters for a tank commander, which would cost you 240 points plus the demolisher cannon, is just going to obliterate any armoured targets within its reach. You can also think about stacking things such as pintle mounted weapons or hunter killer missiles both of which are cheap and generally fairly good in terms of damage output because of the good ballistic skill and potential for re-rolling ones from the tank commander. And if you absolutely need a hard target just vaporised, then you can use Hail of Fire for two command points to give it 12 shots with that demolisher cannon against one hard target. Just having that stratagem plus re-rolling ones on average will kill you a repulsor executioner in one shot. Naturally quite swingy, but the power level just shouldn't be underestimated. Next up we have special weapon squads and command squads. These guys haven't really changed too much in points cost, but have really benefited from the changes to plasma and melter weapons, plus the addition of the new strategic reserve rules. A special weapon squad will cost you 45 points now with either 3 melter guns or 3 plasma guns, so no change at all on the plasma loadout from 8th edition, and they were at least a fairly reliable way of dealing damage, just struggled to get in range. Command squads, special weapon loadouts have also dropped in price, it'll just cost you 64 points for either 4 melters or 4 plasmas on a command squad. And then with the new power levels that they've acquired, you can actually put all of them into outflank with strategic reserve for just one command point. With the updated power levels on the 40k app, special weapon squads are just one power level, and the command squads are just two. It means they can essentially just come in from the sides, at least be able to fire one volley of their special weapon death, admittedly before likely being blown off the table. With space marines being quite so prevalent in the meta at the moment, both plasma and melter are looking very nice indeed, being able to punch through multi-wound, high toughness, high armor targets. In terms of fielding them in-game, you could think about combining them with Officers or Harker going out flanking as well for some rerolls. and if you do think that they're just going to get blown away with shooting next turn, you could think about charging them into close combats to maybe just annoy an enemy vehicle or something. Games Workshop have also said that the Melter rule is going to go to D6 plus 2 damage if you're within health range, which wouldn't be able to be done out of strategic reserve, but it could be good on subsequent turns should they survive. For just over 300 points and 1 command point, being able to have 21 special weapons turn up in the flanks and rear of your opponent's army sounds pretty scary to me. Next up we have Bulgrins, who are one of the units who in general did fairly well out of the points changes from chapter approved. 
The slab shield variants didn't increase in points very much, though there is a bit of a tax on the brute shields now, the invulse they have giving ones, as they're 5 points more than their slab shield counterparts. They were already fairly solid in 8th edition, and I think that 9th edition will have given them a bit of a new lease of life, as there's a lot more emphasis on incredibly durable units bullying their way to the centre of the table to fight the enemy off central objectives. For the unit, I would take the mauls and a mix of the two shields still. I still think that the invul saves are worth having, maybe in a ratio of something like 6 slab shields to 3 brute shields. From there, I'd accompany them with several astropaths, at least two for Night Shroud and Psychic Barrier to make them just even more obnoxious to remove, and maybe one hanging around as well to do some Psychic Maelstrom casting, or a little bit of nice Mortal Wound output. For big units, you could think about adding a Ministorum Priest into the mix for some more attacks, though unless the unit's maxed out, I'd tend to prefer just to have more Bulgren. And when the enemy does target them, you can use the Take Cover Stratagem to add an additional plus one to their saves meaning that you should be able to tank a lot of AP-2 fire on the slab shields, still saving on a 2+. plus. They also have a fun little stratagem for tanking wounds for other infantry squads, which sometimes in some missions I think could be worth it, particularly if you need to keep one unit safe that's doing an action or something. I quite like them in an Astra Militarum army, as you want to keep a lot of your units screened typically, and Borgrins can really help provide that screen by making the opponent want to back off from the army in general. Next we come to the Manticore, who I think has really seen a new lease of life, and is probably the go-to over the Basilisk in my opinion now. A Manticore would cost you 145 points with a Heavy Bolter, again you can upgrade to a Hunter Killer Missile and Heavy Stubber, and you didn't get too much of a points change going from 8th to 9th, which is quite nice because of line of sight ignoring fire is so much more important now. Being able to flatten an enemy unit on the other side of the map that's hiding behind obscuring terrain is really quite a good advantage. The vehicle movement rules also means that it can zip around pretty fast and stay very safe or out of line of sight itself, and there's a bunch of reasons why I think that it might be better than basilisks. Firstly, it does blast a lot better than basilisks do. If the most optimal thing to shoot at is a big unit of 11 plus models and you just need to thin some hordes, then automatically getting 12 shots is very good, and will outperform the basilisk against these targets point for point. The vigilance formations have been removed from a competitive play, with the Grand Tournament mission pack prohibiting them and remove possibly one of the main reasons that you'd want to play Basilisks, being able to fire them twice and ignore cover and things. They got a slightly better points change than the Basilisk, proportionately going up a fair bit less, which does make them more efficient against more targets. Games only last 5 turns now, so only having 4 rockets isn't quite as big a deal, you're only missing out 1 turn of firepower. And they also got a direct fire stratagem called Direct Onslaught, which can up its damage output in a pinch. In game, I'd be very tempted to run them with the full payload tank ace strat, which gives them damage 3 rather than damage d3, a big boost, and you could potentially have two like this if you were willing to forego your warlord trait for one. In terms of regiments, Cadians are pretty solid for the reroll ones, Kaschans for the reroll number of shots, or again potentially a custom regiment for rerolling the number of shots, and maybe getting some auto repairs on the go as well. As with most vehicles, you could also amp up its firepower a bit for a bit of extra anti infantry with the heavy stubber and also a hunter killer missile, which has the fun advantage of being able to make use of full payload if you have it, which could give it a straight flat 6 damage. Finally, on the list of scary guard units, I have chosen to include the infantry squad. Now, these guys have experienced some setbacks going from 8th to 9th but I think that the way that missions are played might well make up for this. They are of course 50 points rather than 40 points, and now if you want a bolter it's plus 2 points, or plus 5 for a plasma gun or melter gun. These would be the first things that I would look to if I was trying to amp up their firepower. The new changes do mean that their points per damage dealing and points per durability are a bit worse than before, and they've also gained a few new issues, such as coherency problems and a bit more vulnerability to the new blast weapons. However, I think that still having a decent contingent of infantry can be really powerful in 9th edition games. With a large number of bodies and obsec, they're pretty much ideal for the objective game. If you've got 30 odd infantry bodies on an objective, then the opponent's really going to struggle to remove them, and you can be a lot more secure about securing that point until the next turn, when you can score the objective. They could also be an absolute nuisance by using move 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 to steal objectives from under the enemy's nose. Being able to run on average 19 inches per turn with a move 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 order really means that they could be all over the map very quickly and take a primary that the opponent thought might be safe. Excellent movement on fairly expendable units is good for scoring secondaries as well, things like engage on all fronts or line breaker, and they're pretty much ideal targets for sitting around and performing an action for a turn, such as raising banners on your own objectives. Having some infantry squads moving down the flanks can be a good way to screen out strategic reserves for your opponent, perhaps making them have to turn up in their own deployment zone. I think just all in all, a lot of infantry can cause the opponent to have some headaches in terms of the objective game in general. 
morale has been improved for them as well, which means that it's no longer as viable a strategy to kill just seven of them, for example, and then be guaranteed that the rest of them are going to run. And also, if the meta develops to a way where people aren't using quite as much inventory, then they might start taking a bit less anti-horde, so there might be a bit of a counter-meta choice. In general, I think that the strongest regiments for infantry at the moment are the tried and tested Kaschan melee blob, which could be potentially getting a bit nastier if you've got power swords that are plus one strength, so strength five Kaschans in combat. You could run them as Cadians by mixing in a few of the cheaper heavy weapons, such as the 15 point las cannons, or maybe going for a custom regiment for maximum survivability, such as wilderness survivors. I generally make sure that they have decent officer cover, so you're going to be able to zoom them all over the board as you intend but otherwise not invest too heavily in them, as their job is to hold the lion and die for the Emperor. So let me know what you think of the units, and if you're planning on using any of these in games going forward, and if there are any units that I haven't mentioned that should have been on this list. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics, we do have fairly regular guard stuff on the channel. And if you have been enjoying my videos, I'd just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page, which is down in the video description below. Channel Patreons get to see one video per week early, there's regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and you also get entered into the monthly prize draw with a chance to win some big kits each and every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.